Good afternoon, everyone. This is Eldred Garcia from Bluefin. And hello, this I am Ed Coe, uh, Director of Information Security Services with Campus Guard. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's joint presentation with Bluefin and Campus Guard, securing and devaluing sensitive information through powerful partnerships and advanced solutions. What we're going to cover today uh, is uh, introductions. We'll start with introductions and then have a quick PCI primer, a high level review. We'll talk about the value of partnerships, uh, case study uh, involving uh, one of our customers, Tufts University, and we'll talk about uh, devaluing data and we'll have some time for uh, questions at the end. I believe we initially intended on this having uh, more uh, audience participation with uh, questions coming in as, uh, as desired when a, when a uh, slide comes up. We'll still try to entertain that. I know that during our practice we went a bit long as uh, Elder and I are both long talkers. So um, we'll try to entertain all questions that you have, but we will dedicate some time at the end uh, for those of you that uh, uh, want to go ahead and participate. <clears throat> So um, quick background on myself and, and Bluefin. This is Eldred Garcia, like I said, the VP of Security Solutions for, for Bluefin. Been in the payments industry for a little over 25 uh, years. Uh, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, fraud prevention uh, organizations uh, primarily focus on, on fraud prevention. Bluefin is a PCI validated point-to-point -point encryption solutions provider. Uh, we're the first in North America. And we provide uh, security for not only payments, but for also for personal information, uh, PII, PHI. And uh, we work um, in, in numerous verticals, higher ed specifically, but also government, healthcare, not only in North America, but throughout uh, several, uh, several places around the world. And for those of you that I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, I'll give you a little background about who I am. I have over 20 years of experience in providing information security and compliance services within campus-based environments. Prior to Campus Guard, I was an information technology and security analyst at the Pennsylvania State University. As a co-founder of Campus Guard, I have personally conducted and delivered hundreds of assessments which have helped me lead our qualified and deeply experienced team of security professionals. As for Campus Guard, we're a cybersecurity and compliance company that specializes in organizations that have complex campus-based environments. Campus Guard performs compliance assessments, including on standards like the PCI DSS, GLBA, FERPA, HIPAA, and the like. We also perform vulnerability scans, penetration tests, and provide ongoing support and training. For each of these services, you have a dedicated customer advocate team, which consists of an assigned customer relationship manager and a primary security advisor, all backed by a team of information security and compliance specialists. This team-based approach ensures that you have all of the qualified and certified personnel deliver the highest quality of customer care available in the market. So with that, let's get started. Um, as the title announced, there's so many acronyms involved, right? P2PE, QSA, SAQ, QIR, CYA. Well, okay, I get it. CYA isn't a PCI acronym, but you know, as we get there, we'll start with the who is PCI. And yes, that is a who and not what. Um, who is PCI? Well, the, let's start with the history. Um, the uh, payment card industry is the WHO, and we're talking about the data security standard in, in, in particular. And uh, the PCI DSS was first released in December of 2004, and it was designed really as a comprehensive list of security standards to help protect cardholder data. Interestingly enough, the PCI Security Standards Council was formed two years later in September of 2006. As we get to who has to be compliant? Well, that's any organization that stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data, or that can impact the security of that data. And that's regardless of whether you do two transactions a year or two million transactions in a year. Who requires you to be compliant? Well, that's the payment brands themselves. That's you know Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Financial Services, and JCB, the Japan Credit Bureau. Those five brands, they're the ones that came together in 2004 to uh, start uh, or to author the PCI DSS, and they're the ones that sit on the board of directors of the PCI Security Standards Council. What's the role of PCI? Well, the Security Standards Council, their job is really to 
help maintain and shape that standard. As you guys all know, PCI DSS 4.0 is right around the corner. Um, they're also responsible for maintaining the other security standards as well as certifying QSAs and ASVs and ISAs and all of those acronyms that we're going to be talking about. As we've talked about acronyms, yeah, guess what? There's a ton of them. And I'll start easy, right? The old ones, the ones that everyone knows. Uh, PCI DSS, we just covered, Payment Credit Industry Data Security Standard, PADSS, the Payment Application Data Security Standard, which is now being replaced with the Secure Software uh, Framework, uh, PTS, the PIN Transaction Security Standard, uh, Self-Assessment Questionnaire, Qualified Security Assessor, Approved Scanning Vendor, on and on and on. And there are these newer ones, right? I call them young because they're not brand new, but ISA, Internal Security Assessor, PCIP, Payment Card Industry Professional, point-to-point -point encryption, QIR, Qualified Integrator and Reseller. And speaking of QIRs, in uh, the end of 2016, Visa announced that uh, on and after the 31st of January 2017, all Level 4 Visa merchants are to only use QIRs, Qualified Integrators and Resellers, to install, integrate, and support point-of-sale applications and terminal installations and integration. Um, also, on top of that, they said that, you know, because most data breaches are occurring at these level four merchants, uh, they were going to start holding acquirers responsible for uh, asserting or validating that their level four merchants were also PCI compliant. So, what does a QIR do? Well, I'll give you the information according to the PCI Security Standards Council. QIRs are integrators and resellers specially trained by the PCI Security Standards Council to address critical security controls while installing merchant payment systems. QIRs reduce merchant risk and mitigate the most common causes of payment card data breaches by focusing on critical security controls. So as you can see, um, in Visa's mandate to say level fours need this, you figure the level four being the small mom and pop uh, if they aren't in, uh, aware of PCI in, in uh, any level of detail, they need that help, especially in those most common ways that payment card data breaches occur and which of those security controls um, you know, will have the most bang for the buck. What does a QSA do? Well, QSAs uh, all are, are um, QSA companies are independent security organizations that have been qualified by the PCI Security Standards Council to validate an entity's adherence to the PCI DSS. QSA employees are individuals who are employed by these QSA companies, and they've satisfied and continue to satisfy all the necessary requirements to, to be a QSA, all that experience, the necessary certifications, so on and so forth. Really and truly, QSAs, they're able to uh, analyze your environment, compare that against the entirety of the DSS, uh, give you interpretations of some of the gray areas that exist in PCI, interpreting the controls. Um, they assess scope. They let you know what things are in, what things are out. Uh, how to address non-applicable questions, um, and either do those customized validations that are coming in PCI 4.0 or uh, in, um, help you with compensating controls. Hello, Ed. Th this is Eldred. Uh, for those who haven't heard my voice yet, this is Eldred from Bluefin. Um, Ed, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask you a question that normally comes up in, in conversations with clients, especially in higher education, that have a very complex uh, payment ecosystem with uh, numerous merchants across the entire organizations, and those merchants range from large to small. Um, the, the question comes when a, a merchant, a particular merchant, or a point of contact, a PCI point of contact at the university asks me, I'm currently working with a QIR, do I need a QSA? Or I'm currently working with a QSA, do I need a QIR? Um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for with, with an audience that we have uh, to shed some clarity on that. Yeah, Eldred, you know, those are excellent questions. And I'd say um, the easy and shortest answer I can give you is, is, look, if you're a level four merchant, you know, Visa put that mandate out there that said, look, if you're, in, if you're installing or integrating or using one of these systems, a QIR must be involved in this process. And that's a regardless of whether you have a QSA that you've partnered with or not. Um, but there are some twists and turns. If anyone uh, deals with a QSA on a regular basis, you know that we've all been programmed to answer that, you know, very generic response of it depends and then, you know, do a little song and dance and then leave the room. Um, but I can tell you that the answer I gave you is, a, is an it depends answer. 
And I'd say if you're looking just at that point of sale application that runs the PADSS software, that it has the components and, and all of that, that you're QIR, your qualified integrated reseller, who's most likely your VAR, your value-added reseller, um, they absolutely need to work in unison and harmony with you to make sure that you're compliant with the visa mandate, uh, regardless of whether you have a QSA or not. Now, here's where it gets interesting. You know, this last bullet point that showed up, which is, you know, what, what does P2PE do, right? And I'll give you the, the page one, um, um, uh, an excerpt from page one of the P2PE standard uh, version 3.0, and it says, merchants benefit from using P2PE solutions due to increased protection of account data and subsequent reduction of the presence of clear text account data within their environment. Uh, you know, basically a, a mouthful of words to say P2PE does this awesome sauce stuff that takes clear text data out of your environment. Uh, it, it removes that equipment from scope and, um, you know, simplifies the, what it takes for you to get compliant. And so here's where the interesting twist happens. So let's say that you're using a P2PE solutions provider, point of sale equipment that integrates with that uh, PCI listed P2PE solution, and you have a QSA company that you've partnered with. And uh, Eldred, you know, you kind of replay that same question that says, you know, do I need a QIR and a QSA and this P2PE all working together uh, to meet this visa mandate? And I will tell you that answer is no. Uh, thanks to the P2PE solution, you've taken that point of sale application and changed it from being that which touches cardholder data, which has those areas of um, risk where those common causes of payment data breaches exist or the critical security controls that help protect those payment applications and the hardware they run on. Because P2PE and that, that solution and that pin pad take all of that data out of scope. By the time it touches that computer, that, that cash register, it's just ciphertext data with no ability for you as the merchant to decrypt the data. Uh, it pulls all of that out of scope, and now suddenly you are now no longer working with a payment application and that point-of-sale equipment. You're working with a P2PE solution. And so implementing that P2PE solution hand-in-glove with your P2PE solution provider and your QSA providing you guidance uh, following that PIM or P2P implementation manual means that you do you now no longer need that QIR to meet those requirements because that that visa mandate has vanished due to the fact that you're no longer touching cardholder data on that equipment. Thanks, Ed. I think that clarifies um, where a QIR is being used um, and the difference between using a QIR, a QSA, and what happens when you use P2PE. Appreciate it. All right. Um, talking about P2PE, so P2PE encryption essentially. Encryption um, is important to note that it is not new technology. Encryption has been around for ever and a day. Julius Caesar used to use encryption. So encryption, while it does provide security in and of itself, not all encryption is created equal as you, as you can imagine. So the PCI, <clears throat> excuse me, the PCI Council um, identified was that while encryption uh, was absolutely critical in devaluing the information that's flowing through your environment, so when somebody breaks in, um, they can't steal valuable information, they also identified that the process around the encryption um, had a lot of vulnerabilities. Who holds uh, the encryption keys? Who holds the decryption keys? Who manages the devices that have the encryption keys? So there were over 600 different vulnerabilities that were identified by the PCI Council, which is why they created a PCI validated point-to-point -point encryption uh, offering. Um, Bluefin happened to be the first uh, organization in North America did, that went ahead and validated to this point-to-point -point encryption solution and addressed all those vulnerabilities that the PCI Council has. So what does that mean for an end merchant? Well, what that means for an end merchant is that all the things that PCI Council has put in place to ensure that you as a merchant secure that sensitive cardholder information starts to be reduced significantly. So imagine having to do penetration testing, system segmentation, scanning of your environments to make sure there's, a, there's no cardholder sensitive information in there. All that stuff goes away. Why? By using a validated P2PE encryption solution, what, what you're doing is devaluing the information at the moment that it touches a P2PE device. And that encrypted blob, which it has no cardholder sensitive information is what flows in and out of your environment. This is what qualifies you for a self-assessment questionnaire or an SAQ P2PE. 
And an SAQ P2PE is significantly smaller or reduced than a regular SAQ. Just for an example, an SAQ P2PE has around 33 questions. Important to note that not all questions are answered. So it typically it boils down to about 19 or 20 questions. They're all administrative questions, making sure that you are indeed using a validated P2PE solution. So if you running down from an SAQ, traditionally a C, God forbid a D that has over 300 and some odd questions down to a P2PE, you're gonna benefit from two things right off the bat. One is the significant reduction of compliance costs on a regular annual basis. And on the flip side, you're gonna re remove, not protect, you're gonna remove all that cardholder sensitive information from your environment. So when, not if, when somebody breaks into your system because we can't keep people from breaking into your system, um, there is nothing to steal. So P2P is more of a deterrence, if you will, versus a prevention. Fantastic. So as we look at um, all of these acronyms and we get to the question of, so, you know, who should I work with, right? You know, and I think Eldred asked that question and said, do I need this? Do I need that? QIR, P2P, QSA? You know, that answer is, is yes. You know, when you look at the fabric of, um, you know, PCI compliance and uh, cardholder data security, they all play a role. And again, due to the fact that you either have that visa mandate that uh, you need from that QIR, right, that says that's how that's what I'm meeting there, or uh, the P2PE benefit, as Eldred pointed out, reducing scope, simplifying compliance and validation, uh, enhancing your security, right, going from those 330 plus questions down to 33, or as Eldred pointed out, you know, due to a, a bunch of them being NA, really having about 19 responses. Um, getting that, uh, devaluing that data, getting it out of your environment so that it's now no longer touching um, your, your networks and computers and, and the like, uh, there's tremendous benefit with those uh, uh, that P2P provides. And then um, for QSAs, right, the benefit that we're looking at here is, is validating compliance being able to help you with those self-assessment questionnaires, or if you're um, you know, not an SAQ eligible merchant and you have to have an on-site assessment, you need a QSA to do that. Um, QSAs can help you analyze risk. They can help you with policies and procedures and making sure they meet up with those uh, PCI controls, uh, give you additional merchant training as necessary, making sure that you uh, align with the 12.6 uh, requirement. And you know, I think the other part that the QSAs can do is help you identify areas where P2P can't necessarily solve the issue immediately. And one of those big areas is voice over IP. Now, I know that there's plenty of information provided in the uh, 2018 guidance document that the PCI Council put out, the supplemental information uh, protecting telephone-based payments. I think it's, it was the second iteration that came out in November of 18. Um, there are still a handful of scenarios where you can have a voice over IP deployment that uses, you know, plastic instruments, um, that's completely managed by a third-party provider, so the local exchange carrier is delivering your voice services that, you know, the PCI Council considers to still be out of scope, uh, or at least out of your scope, much like those analog POTS lines were. Uh, but I can tell you that there's, um, you know, probably a hundred more different scenarios where VoIP is in scope, and you have lots more issues. And I can say that even an hour-long presentation about voice over IP will not be enough to cover all of the, the various twists and turns. And that's where working with your QSA partner is gonna be you know, quite helpful in helping you navigate uh, those minefields. Um, and things like fax, you know, maybe the old school analog uh, plain paper fax is okay, but as we start seeing people uh, being a bit more environmentally conscious, you know, typically faxes that uh, fax machines you have have all these spam faxes coming in about lunch specials and things of that nature. Um, you know, or you've migrated from having the standalone dumb analog plain paper fax to the uh, big, large network connected multifunction devices and things of that nature, or you've gone fax to email or web based fax. You know, and what does that do to scope? And and you know, can P2P solve that? Again, that answer is going to be no because it's uh, it, it's on that end of the equation. Hey Ed, I think this uh, one one additional thing that I would add on the QSA benefit. And this is, uh, I think is, is quite important, working with merchants in, in higher ed in, in any vertical for that matter. Uh, there's a couple of things that uh, always come up in, in, in conversations when we're talking about the different solutions that P2P have, whether it's a standalone terminal or an, or, um, an integrated terminal um, to address a number of different payment channels that may, may or may not exist. 
um, merchants start to um, see the benefit of deploying P2PE and they start thinking about new ways to generate new revenue streams, open up new payment channels, more complex things that they weren't able to do before. This is where absolutely a QSA comes in uh, to play, where they can help that merchant identify potential pitfalls in developing these new payment strategies, making sure that what they do deploy in a P2PE solution and reduce the scope, they don't turn around and mess it up, if you will, by opening up new opportunities for payments and exposing new payment risk. A QSA will be there to make sure that during that development process or that exploring process of, of creating new payments, um, that they make sure that they're watching out for their clients so they can absolutely benefit uh, with P2PE across the entire payment channel. You know, Aldred, that's an excellent point. And it kind of uh, goes right into this next slide. We're talking about the value of that partnership uh, between you know, P2PE providers and, and QSA companies in that um, you know, what kind of value can you provide? And I think, uh, Eldred, you hit the nail on the head there as, as you know, getting compliant is really just one step of maintaining compliance, right? Getting there once is one thing, but then continuing to do it with business as usual year over year month over month, day over day, uh, you know, certainly takes some effort. And knowing that, you know, business isn't static, that there aren't, uh, you know, single solutions that you put in once and you never think about again, um, that you need to be evolving, that you need to be thinking about customer service and that you don't shoot yourself in the foot and um, end up getting yourselves back to noncompliance. Um, that's certainly that, that value of partnership, knowing what solutions are out there. And thinking about, um, you know, knowing what solutions are out there, let's talk about evaluating technology and, and you know, the, the, the Campus Guard way or the QSA way of kind of looking at technology. And I'll turn the mic over back to, to Eldred to talk about the Bluefin way of looking at technology. And we'll have a little back and forth about, you know, how we each view um, these particular points in technology and how you can see that they come together quite nicely. And so thinking about um, integrations, right, you know, performing an assessment on our end, helping you guys uh, determine whether you are or aren't PCI compliant. Uh, one of the first things we look at if you have a piece of technology that you're being used that doesn't have P2PE is, you know, we ask the question, does an integrated P2PE solution exist for this particular product to immediately help you gain the benefits of P2PE, reduce scope and so on and so forth? No, I appreciate, you know, bringing up integration because I remember back in 2015 when I first started working in higher education and we had essentially no partners uh, that are integrated with Bluefin with point to point encryption and I started um, working with individual um, universities and really understanding the complexity of higher ed, you know, it, it, it is a um, best way I've always described it, it's a small city, it has everything under the sun, it has every single payment channel you can think of it has a whole slew of, of third party vendors out there. Each merchant is really an island of themselves. So the collection of the merchants is really what makes up the university. When I started working with universities and understanding the complexity of, of this, I started realizing the need to be able to work with all these individual third party vendors that all these merchants had. And it really became apparent uh, of the effort that we were going to have to undertake in order to be able to offer P2PE to higher education. And we literally did it one by one. And, and I would tell you that the partnership that we have with Campus Guard, um, being at the forefront with the merchant, identifying all these payment touch points, all these third party vendors and where all these opportunities to integrate was key in Bluefin really becoming um, the P2PE solutions provided with the largest number of higher education specific integrated vendors in the market anywhere in conjunction with all the P2PE devices that all these different partners needed to support. And we, again, we did it one by one, really going to a university, talking to a merchant and saying, what, where are you taking payments? What channel are you taking payments? What merch, uh, vendor are you utilizing in this channel to take payments? You guys being in the forefront and identifying these third party vendors in conjunction with the university, bringing them all together with Bluefin and talking about an integration. Um, we, we, we were able to develop a very fast track. And I'm talking about realistically an, an average of approximately two weeks. We were able to integrate 
individual third-party vendors and be able to offer downstream to the merchant a P2PE solution with their existing third-party vendor. That way they continue using the, uh, the vendor's uh, services without ripping up that relationship and then bringing in P2PE to remove that payment environment out of scope. Absolutely, it was a partnership uh, uh, a moment uh, that we identified. Thanks, Eldred, for that. And I think you've touched on these next couple of points that you know we're we're talking about in this in this partnership slide. Is that you know one of the other areas that we always look at in terms of of evaluations as we're looking at that that, that technology is you know well let's say that this particular vendor. Uh, doesn't have a P2PE integration, or are they interested in getting one for whatever oddball reason? Uh, is there a competitive product that has the features that you, you've always wanted? And does that product have a P2PE integration? And I'll give you a great example of that. You know, last year uh, we were doing a, a, a PCI assessment of a university that happened to have a, a public radio station, an NPR member station, and they were using uh, uh, Jackson River Digital Services as their, you know, CRM and payment processing and underwriting and all of those functions. And I believe NPR had made a decision that uh, they were uh, either ceasing or, or putting aside that relationship with Jackson River. And they said, you know, hey, individual member stations, you can continue your relationship if you want to, um, but you'll be doing it on your own and not through the NPR umbrella. And as, as we were doing the assessment, we came just at that time during that decision-making process, and we said, hey, wait a second. You know, we work with a lot of colleges and universities and those that have NPR member stations, and we know that the gold standard in terms of CRM is Allegiance. Um, you know, have you guys thought about uh, using the Allegiance CRM uh, system over, uh, you know, this, this brand that you're using today? Um, and they said, yeah, you know, their eyes lit up and said, oh, we'd love Allegiance, but it was cost prohibitive, and it had this, and it had this, and it had this. And we said, well, you know, Allegiance, uh, with all of its great features, also has an integrated point-to-point -point encryption offering. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a cost offset that says, you know, right now you're running a CVT environment at best with this machine and scope, all the care and feeding that goes into it to use this particular system that you're using to process payments versus, um, this uh, Allegiance system that you can implement and put in that has integrated P2PE, so it's in the P2PE scope, the computer's out of scope, the network's out of scope, the machine's out of scope. Um, you know, here are the additional benefits if you're doing a fundraiser and you're having a sidewalk sale, and obviously this is all pre-COVID, right? But, you know, you're doing something uh, out in the public, you, you know, where you're not having to worry about bringing a secure network connection and all of those things. Is there a cost offset that helps justify getting this uh, CRM that you've always wanted uh, but now with the scope reduction and the additional security and all the other benefits, you know, is it there? And I think, Elder, that's one of the benefits that, that we see on our end as we look across the board and all of those integrations that you guys do is that there are so many products out there that it's the, if, if this solution doesn't have it, is there a like solution that already has the integration? And is that, is that also, you know, kind of incentive for the, you know, the outgoing product or the product that you're, you're threatening to leave? Uh, to make them get that integrated P2PE, because you're right, you know, there are times where those relationships, you don't want to rip things out and uh, drop in a new solution, but you want them to to get that integrated P2PE. So, Ed, you, you bring up a, an interesting point. Um, one of the things that we we started bumping up against when we were having these discussions that there, while there were merchants that had traditional standalone payment environments that they just needed a, to uh, substitute a, a, a P2PE device for an existing device that was not P2PE, those were easy, right? Those were the easy ones that you just plug and play, unconnect from the wall, connect another one, your P2PE, you're good to go, that was easy. The challenging ones were those third-party vendors that provided merchant services. Those third-party vendors that had their own gateway that were connected to the processor for that university, that ripping them out would cause a whole slew of, of a chain reaction of changing processors, changing gateways, and the, the customer, the end customer, the merchant did not want to rip those relationships out. So that's extremely challenging uh, with regards to integrating a P2PE solution. Luckily for us, we did not anticipate this when we made this decision way back when we decided to do point-to-point -point encryption. We recognized that there were verticals out there, not specifically higher ed at that time, 
that had very complex payment environment, that had multiple merchant service relationships connected to multiple processors. And we needed to create a solution that we can go in and regardless if it was a simple plug and play or if it was a complex merchant services relationship that we could integrate to so the merchant can continue using whatever services that they had and not be interrupted by implementing a P2P solution. And this is what we call Bluefin decryption as a service or decryptics. It allows us to go into any environment and connect to anybody. In this, there are a number of higher ed specific vendors out there that do have their own merchant services, that do have their own gateways, that we have already integrated to. And this again, allowed us to very quickly through the partnership with Campus Guard, identify this merchant is using an integrated uh, partner that's using their own merchant services. We immediately know it's decryption as a service. And this one is just a standalone solution. You've already done the work for us. We can go in and then, focus on those simple plug and play solutions. So through that, again, through that partnership um, with the university and in Campus Guard, we can quickly assess a payment environment and come to the table with different solutions, different offerings to ultimately provide a P2PE solution. Yeah, and I can think of one example in particular, when we talk about getting that vendor to integrate with point-to-point -point encryption. Uh, Eldred, this is a number of years ago, but uh, there was a state university in uh, New York State, and uh, they were using New Line, the athletics ticketing platform. And um, it was right around the time that New Line had gone through a painful integration to an end-to-end -end encrypted solution. I believe it was from MagTech, and I could be wrong. But uh, it was a MagTech solution, but it was end-to-end -end encrypted. It wasn't PCI-listed P2PE. And when they tried to sell this solution, uh, as an upgrade or enhancement to uh, add security. While we didn't disagree that it had added security, we knew that it didn't reduce scope. It didn't meet the, the goals of what this particular institution wanted to see. And they were already a Bluefin customer. And we said, hey, can we just have a conference call with them and, and say, you know, since, you're, since this institution already had a relationship with Bluefin and they wanted that, you know, unified gateway and Bluefin as the provider uh, could they get a real honest-to-goodness point-to-point encryption solution integrated with New Lion uh, using Bluefin? And it, originally, those discussions ended up as, no, we went through this painful integration process with, uh, and again, if it's not MagTech, I apologize, but with MagTech, and uh, we're not doing that again. We rewrote the back end. We did all this stuff. No one's buying it. We don't want to go through that pain point again. Forget it. We're not doing it. And I remember putting this conference call together and uh, bringing Eldred and the school uh, representatives from Campus Guard and then uh, New Line together saying, this is what this is. And as Eldred pointed out, you know, here's kind of how decryptics works. This decryption is a service. Uh, and it gives you uh, PCI listed, PCI validated point-to-point -point encryption that gives you full scope reduction, which is what your customers are asking for. And it, it gave the ability to get those win, 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 win type of solutions that you typically don't see uh, out in the world, right? The first win is the, the, the institution, the school itself, got a PCI-listed P2PE uh, uh, product that helped reduce scope and it greatly enhanced security and devalued all the data and all of the good stuff that P2PE provides. It was a win for Campus Guard that, you know, we were able to help, uh, you know, orchestrate and, and make that solution and help uh, that, that thing come into place. It was an aid to Bluefin that it was, you know, one more integration, one more, one more partnership that if it exists, that it expands the portfolio. And it was a win for New Line that they can now, you know, advertise and say, hey, you know, we offer PCI-listed P2PE. If you want to use us as your ticketing platform, this is what our competitors don't do. This is how we can reduce your scope and all of that. And so it was an amazing uh, 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 effort to put that together. And I think really the, the, the key to this was the hey, if you have your own process and you use this decryptics, it's, you know, an average of a two-week uh, return time, turnaround time to get this thing integrated. And I think that was really the part that made it easy for New Line to make the decision. Absolutely. Um, the only thing I would add to that, it, it, it is an absolute add, add, uh, added value to the, to the vendor um, when they can, like you mentioned, do an integration in a very short period of time with a very little uh, IT lift on, on their end and then leverage that one integration uh, for multiple things. One, for the, their existing relationship, that means they don't lose that relationship. Um, but number two, they can turn around and now offer 
that P2P solution with that integration to all the rest of their customers and every other prospect. So they have a competitive advantage in the market because now whatever service that they're offering out there, they can literally say, you're not comparing apples to apples anymore. So if you pay me five cents per transaction and you're paying a competitor of mine five cents per transaction and I have P2PE, you're definitely paying less for my service than you are for theirs because now you have to do less for us with us to be in compliant and you're going to have to do all the other stuff to be in compliant with them. So it's absolutely a, a win for, for them from, from an added value. Um, if, if, and and Ed, not, not to push you forward, but I mean, I'm a very visual person and the next slide, I know I'm you know white knuckling it because it, I, I love to just sh show diagrams. And this is a very quick, simple way of, of showing what literally happens in, in decryption as a service. For all those third-party vendors that you have connected out there that have their own gateway services or have their own merchant services, um, we literally plug into the bottom, if you will, if you look at this diagram. Um, you have you put a P2PE terminal, everything gets encrypted in that, in that P2PE terminal, that encrypted blob was, goes in and out of the merchant environment, qualifying you for an, an SAQ P2PE. It hits that third-party vendor, which they have their own merchant services or own, their own gateway. They receive that blob. They can't do anything with that blob, obviously, because they're not the P2PE solutions provider. They can't pass it on to the processor because they're not going to be able to read it. What they do is a quick API call out to us, about 30 uh, milliseconds, a blink of an eye. We decrypt it in, in our uh, hardware security modules that are PCI validated to do point-to-point -point encryption, security rapid, shoot it right back to them, and they continue doing what they were normally doing before we got there. They go out, get an authorization, come back, generate the same tokens that they were doing, like if we didn't exist. On the return flight, we're obviously not involved because there is no cardholder sensitive information. From a merchant perspective, nothing changes. It's completely transparent to them. They continue taking payments like they were, they continue processing like they were, they continue receiving their deposits in the bank just like they were. All we're doing is plugging into the third party vendor. Vendors happy, merchants happy, everybody, it comes out winning, like you mentioned. Yeah, and Eldred, I think that's the beauty of this thing, right, is that the, the merchant is processing like they always were it, with the added benefit of not having that computer or network into scope. And that really brings me to, you know, kind of this, this next picture here of our case study. And uh, Tufts University, as we did the assessment and took a look around, one of the areas that we uh, came across, uh, the computer and network being in scope, was the virtual terminal that was being used in advancement. So they were a CyberSource customer having their giving pages as a, a part of CyberSource and that, um, you know, on the back end, we're using the administrative interface and, and using the, the CyberSource gateway as a virtual terminal. And looking at, the, at their scenario and what was happening, it really does come back to that picture. And knowing that there was a Bluefin integration already with CyberSource meant that with very little effort, we can acquire a P2PE pin pad that plugs in, integrates with CyberSource, implementing it in the, in the way as described in the, in the PIM, the point-to-point -point encryption implementation manual, and getting them off and running, uh, it paints exactly the picture that Eldred was saying, that the merchant still operates exactly as they had done. They collect the data in the way they collect it, you know, through mail and through other mechanisms and all of that. And instead of keying it into the computer keyboard, they key that cardholder data securely into that uh, P2PE pin pad, it still gets processed through CyberSource. The magic happens. The reconciliation still works the same way. And it was quite an elegant solution and an easy way for us to add P2PE into the picture without disrupting the business environment. It was just a, a minor distraction to go ahead and acquire those P2PE pin pads. Now, there's another example over at Tufts, though, that I think went a slightly different direction. And this is the uh, phone-a-thon or uh, you know, uh, outgoing calling campaigns. And um, in this one, I'm going to address that there was what I'll call a, a P2PE gap, at least at the time of assessment, uh, there really weren't any great solutions that uh, fit the entire picture. Um, we knew that there was a Bluefin integration with Campus Call so that you could have all of the data that's input uh, go through that uh, same P2PE process, keep the computers and networks and all of that out of scope. But in the case of Tufts, they were using uh, not only the Ruffalo and Levitt's Campus Call product, but they were also using the secure internet dialing, that uh, IP soft phone that has all that rich integration that RNL provides, you know, things that do, you know, better, uh, you know, line busy detection or answering machine, auto redials are better and all of that stuff. 
And uh, instead of giving that up and rolling backwards in technology to those old uh, antiquated, uh, you know, dial vision dialers that, you know, hooked up to phones on analog phone lines and all of that stuff that had, you know, one tenth of the features of secure internet dialing. Um, they said, look, we really need uh, secure internet dialing. We can't go back to the technology. We've loved the way that, uh, you know, Ruffalo and Levitt has supported us through this, but we really need to reduce the scope. And knowing that there wasn't a great option for securing the voice portion of it, especially being voice over IP and IP soft phone, Tufts made the decision to outsource that entire process to Ruffalo and Levitt. They call it the master's program uh, at, at RNL. And uh, the easy out for them in terms of compliance was to say, hey, you know, RNL, you guys are responsible. You take care of the machines. You take care of the computers. You take care of the network. You take care of PCI compliance. Um, and it was, it was one way that, again, we looked at all the options and looking at it saying P2PE, while it gets you absolutely more security and it absolutely enhances uh, what you're doing, it won't be an SAQ P2PE because of the IP soft phone. And here are the options, and, and that's the way that uh, Tufts decided to go in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting to that full compliance. There are still other areas that, uh, you know, are, are dealing with um, uh, payment card issues, and now with COVID and work from home and potentially IP soft phones coming into the picture, uh, you know, modifications to policies and procedures and all of that stuff, it really brings uh, that next portion of, the, uh, of this presentation into question, right, which is the... The, the pivot of, you know, how do I keep my data safe from hackers, you know, uh, especially in, in the work from home environment where I have way less visibility of what's going on. Well, Ed, um, a couple of things I want to note uh, on this slide. Number one, if you if you look towards the, the middle of the slide towards the right, you're going to see that there's an average of 29,000 plus attacks per minute. That's a huge amount of attacks. Why are they doing this? They're doing this because they're going after sensitive information in order to monetize it and make money. Important thing to note, this is not how, how hackers started, right? Hackers started because there were students, just like you have. You're teaching them, you're educating them how to develop operating systems. They're navigating in your systems, not because they have any malicious intent, just because they're bored of their games and you guys are putting up really fancy firewalls and VPNs and they're trying to figure out how to get in without malicious intent. So if you look back in 1960, MIT students were doing exactly that. They were pushing their systems, looking for weaknesses, how to improve their systems. Um, as time developed and people started figuring out better and better ways of breaking into the system, they started realizing that there was stuff in there that they can monetize. If you go down to the current state of where we are, we're no longer just getting in there to figure out where the weaknesses are and try to improve our systems. These are highly sophisticated, organized state-sponsored, financially funded businesses that are deploying strategic attacks in order to capture sensitive information and monetize this. They're capturing not payment information, they're capturing everything. Sure, this, is, this conversation is about PCI. How do we protect payment card information? This is why we have P2PE. When we deployed P2PE um, back in 2015 in higher ed, those questions start coming up. Hey, this is great. This is addressing my payment information. I can do an SAQ P2PE, but guess what? I have a ton of other information that's still sensitive that people are still breaking in and, you know, and capturing it and monetizing it. And we're ending up on, you know, headlines on CNN. Can you do something to help up us out uh, about this? And the answer is not until almost last year. Somewhere around last year, we, we, we were able to finally leverage the existing technology that we utilize to do point-to-point -point encryption to be able to devalue everything else. So we can absolutely do the exact same thing for point-to-point -point encryption that we can do for PII or PHI. So names, address, email, phone numbers, date of birth, whatever it is in your system, we can do the equivalent of P2PE for PCI. For PCI, you have to be PCI compliant, obviously, to make sure that cardholder sensitive information is not compromised. And you do that by devaluing the information. You can't, you don't have it, they can't steal it, right? Well, we've done the exact same thing with Shield Connect. Shield Connect does exactly that. It devalues everything else. It devalues PII, PHI to address the equivalent of PCI, CCPA, GDPR, HIPAA, 
all the funny other acronyms that exist out there by doing the exact same thing, devaluing the information. So now a higher ed education vertical, a healthcare government can go in and say, we can absolutely secure our system, not because we can prevent people from breaking in, which they can't, no one can prevent anybody from breaking in, but you can absolutely prevent them from stealing information, stealing anything of value by devaluing everything that you have within the organization, whether it's uh, payment information or PII stuff. So Eldred, those are fantastic points and it really you know, helps uh, coming into these, these wrap up slides here. And I can tell you that you know, when we get to this first point, right? it's better together. And it's, been, it's, it's in the title of this presentation that you guys have sat through, uh, P2PE plus QSA, absolutely working with both a P2PE provider and QSA. That partnership, especially those that have experienced the proven track record of successes in higher education, they're extremely valuable. Knowing that PPE is, well, it's just P to PE. And more importantly, it's not E to E. It's not end-to-end -end encryption. And don't get me wrong, you know, right? P to PE is awesome. Never before have we had such a great opportunity to devalue data, reduce scope, uh, and all while maintaining your workflow, your customer service, uh, you know, all of those things. But at the end of the day, P2PE is still only just one part of your overall strategy of PCI compliance. On its own, it doesn't help with risk assessments or training or how to handle those changes in the environment or new solutions or things of that nature. And that's really where that partnership and, and QSAs will be of value to you. The other thing here um, is that you know, the age-old adage, an ounce of prevention, right, is worth a pound of cure. Um, you know, don't wait to implement smarter or better solutions. This isn't 2015. You're not buying a Model T Ford, right? My nod there is uh, you can get a Model T Ford in any color as long as you want it black. Um, you know, it's not the old world. You don't have, uh, you know, this is the only way you get these services. Options are out there for great solutions that can help you reduce risk and shrink scope and protect your data. Uh, and don't apply these concepts just to PCI data, but to all sensitive data. You know, Eldred pointed out in the last slide of uh, what Shield Connect is and what it can do to help protect all sensitive information. And really the time to act is now and not after you have a data breach when the damage is already done. Absolutely, Ed. Uh, I think that's a great point. I mean, obviously security is not top of mind on everybody's mind every day, obviously, because they have other things to, they need to work on. And, and unfortunately, it becomes top of mind when they end up in headline news. That is not uh, the best strategy to wait. Um, obviously, we can help you today and tomorrow. Um, we can't do anything about what happened yesterday. So like, like, uh, like Ed said, you know, um, the sooner that you know, there's a plan in place, identifying the vulnerabilities, deploying uh, solutions that can devalue the information that the bad guys are going after um, is, is a whole lot better than trying to uh, clean up, if you will, after the fact. All right, and the final point I want to leave you with is remove the gold in the vault. Um, you know, I, I don't think we can make it any simpler than this. Um, you know, when there, where there's a will, there's a way. People will try to get to the data that you have, and if you build more walls, if you put more controls in, they're all still ultimately defeatable. But it goes back to the other adage, you know, you can't steal. You can't get stolen what you don't have, right? Criminals can't take what you don't have. And by not having it within your possession anymore, you've greatly enhanced the security of, of your enterprise and given it to someone whose job is to secure all of that data. So with that, I believe we have a handful of uh, minutes left for uh, questions. We will turn it over to questions. And obviously, if we don't get a chance to get to your question uh, before the end of this, uh, feel free to reach out to us individually. Our contact information is below. So you can type them in right into the chat box, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, or raise your hand, we can unmute you, and then you can ask that question uh, in person. Ed, 
Ed, I'm not seeing any any questions come in through chat. I think you've uh, you've done an excellent <laughs> job. Of, oh, I see. I see of, one. I see one oh, coming in here, Eldred. Yep. So uh, it says, apologies uh, if this is redundant since I joined late, but how do you devalue data? And so I'll take a stab at this, but Eldred, I know that, uh, you know, P2PE being, um, you know, your bread and butter, I'll, I'll absolutely turn this over to you for the, for the full picture. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about devaluing data, it's, it's devaluing it on, on your end, right? So um, in terms of getting that gold out of the vault, um, using a technology like, using technology like tokenization along with point-to-point -point encryption so that it's secure in transmission, it's being replaced with tokenized data so that you don't actually have the data. You've devalued it in terms of what the criminal can gain access to. It's no, now no longer valuable data within your store. It is, um, it, it is now uh, outside of your control. Eldred, I don't know if you want to add some color to that. Yeah, so um, the answer is, is basically a two-part response because devaluing data depending if it's payment information or non-payment information. So payment information traditionally with point-to-point -point encryption, what basically happens is that you have a million or so unique encryption keys in the device. So whether you swipe, dip, tap, or enter into a, a P2PE device, one of those unique encryption keys, in addition to a number of device fingerprinting uh, attributes from that device, uh, all get encrypted with that encryption key. So a traditional PAN, if you will, cardholder information is about 16 digits plus expiration date. Um, a fully encrypted uh, transaction, you're talking about 250 plus characters that include a whole bunch of uh, finger device uh, attributes. And that devaluation of that data is what flows in and out of your environment. Somebody grabs that, they can't make sense of it. It's It's you know, it's, it's, it's noise, essentially. That's how you devalue the data from a payments perspective. Once it gets out of your environment, we decrypt with a decryption key that's uh, only within uh, hardware security modules that are PCI validated to decrypt that information. And then we use that decrypted information to go get your authorization. And as uh, Ed mentioned on the way back, in order for you to be able to store that devalued information, we generate a, a token, a substitute for that sensitive information that we can store in our systems for you to do subsequent transaction, reoccurring transactions or whatnot. So even if they take this token, it's absolutely useless. That's on the payment side. On the PII stuff, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's essentially the same technology. We take the information, format preserving. When I say format preserving, think about your social security number. If a social security number is, is within a software application is looking for that format in order to be able to process it. So we use encrypting information, encrypting technology similar to P2PE, but we maintain um, that format um, in order for us to be able to utilize that encrypted blob within your system. So when a customer needs to access that information, they can display it, they can store it within the field that that information resides and it is formatted in the same way but it's completely devalued. So a one, two, three, four, five may not be one, two, three, four, five. It may be a jumbled up in numbers. So somebody steals it, can't make sense of it. So what we wanna make sure that there is no relationship between one piece of data and other pieces of data, name, address, email, phone numbers, date of birth, social security number, all that kind of stuff. You start putting things together, that's social engineering. That's how you create fraud. If you devalue all that information and all you're stealing is noise, then they can't do anything with that information. Again, real quick, similar technology, different ways of going about it, but essentially we're encrypting the information, then we're tokenizing the information. Uh, on the PII stuff, you'll have access in order to see the information. On the payment side, you'll never have access. You don't need it. You'll never have access to that information to be stolen. I hope that answers your question. If not, I know we're running out of time. My information is at the bottom, more than happy to give me a call and I can talk about your specifics and then we can drill down more granular le uh, level to talk about how we would do that in an envir environment uh, that, that's uh, specific to you. All right, thanks for that, Eldred. We have one more question that uh, has come in uh, privately here. Uh, it says, since PADSS is going to be retired in 2022, are you seeing vendors adapting their P2PE integrations in preparation for the transition to the secure software framework or SSF? And so this is an interesting question is that, 
you know, do we see more folks jumping ship to P2PE, or do we see them kind of going down the road that they did when, um, you know, uh, again, in, in I think it was 2012 where Visa put, put out the mandate that you will only use PADS as validated applications and, and those types of things, was we saw a lot of vendors in that PADSS space rip the payment processing out of their application, right? Because if you think about the definition of uh, a payment application, it stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data for the purposes of settlement or authorization. Uh, they said, look, we'll just take the settlement and authorization piece out of, of this uh, product, uh, you know, use a wholly outsourced or third-party gateway, and it now is automatically and magically no longer a payment application. Uh, they took that shortcut. And we see vendors continue to go down that road, but I'd say that as as we start seeing more of these benefits of point-to-point -point encryption and that the industry itself, the, the merchants, are clamoring for things that reduce scope, um, we're absolutely seeing more P2PE integrations coming. In fact, if you look at the, um, the, the official list that the PCI Council maintains of P2PE solutions, it now you know, covers four pages versus the you know, single page or a couple pages that did even just a couple of years ago, that there are more solutions that are being vetted, more solutions that are being integrated uh, to, to pave the way for these types of solutions because, you know, the value is there. And Eldred, I don't know if you have anything to add here about, uh, you know, seeing additional work in the, in the uh, P2PE space uh, with these uh, integration vendors, uh, again, trying to uh, sidestep or, uh, you know, transition their way into a secure software framework. Um, all, all I can tell you, Ed, is um, um, I not only work in, in the U.S., um, I have uh, clients and I'm responsible for Latin America and the Caribbean region. I have clients in Asia Pacific and Europe and the demand by third party vendors and clients for on the payment side for P2PE and on the, on the data side for for uh, Shield Connect. It has nothing but increased only because um, at the end of the day, they don't want the data. They don't want to. And they, don't, they don't want to manage the data. They want to devalue the data. And they know, from a payments perspective, deploying a P2PE solution is a whole lot simpler than going through a whole different new process that um, that involves, you know, heavy IT lifting and whatnot. Deploying a, a P2PE solution sometimes takes no more than a week uh, on, a, on a very easy, you know, plug and play scenario. That's that's super quick. Um, in order for you to make sure that you don't have sensitive information and be able to comply with PCI to be able to roll out this kind of technology in, in about a week. So uh, all we've seen in every single region that I work with is an increase in demand for P2PE and, and Shield Connect to, so they can continue doing what they normally do, just devalue the information that they're handling. Excellent. Thanks for that, Eldred. I know we've uh, you know bumped up to our time frame here. So uh, if your question was not addressed in the time frame that we had, again, our contact information is listed below at the, uh, at, at the bottom of this presentation. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone.